I've seen that God is real in your life. You've made a commitment to me and also to God to raise your family in church. You've stood with that great Bible warrior, Joshua, who said, choose you this day whom you'll serve. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Ron, I believe that you will become a model husband, and later on in life, as God blesses this union, a model father. Remember your godly commitments, and your days with Vicki will be wonderful, joyful, and yet fulfilling days. I love you, and I'm very, very proud of you, Ron. You're a real gentleman. Vicki, it's real hard for me to find words to describe you. I've known you since you were a little girl. I've seen you in times of great adversity in your life. I've seen you rise up above that and always come back to the church, which is the teaching of the Word of God. I've watched John and Ann as you grew up. I've seen them pray for you. I've seen their love demonstrated for you. What a great people they are. I can remember in time past when you were in high school getting your education that Ann would come to me on several occasions and say, Preacher, pray for Vicki. And I did. Someone has rightly said that it takes adversity to make us. And if that's true, then certainly you've had some adversity in your life because you've risen to heights above that adversity. And you've become a lady among ladies. Your entire life revolves around the giving of yourself to others. I've observed you as you love and respect your elders with a loving smile and a gentle hug. I've also observed you as you knelt down to a small child and you cradled it close to you and how you bring joy and friendship and happiness to that child's life. Vicki, you're a great lady. You never try to be the center of attack of attention. Yet your presence is always felt, giving support and confidence to all that you touch. You're a true lady. And Vicki, I, I say this, you're a lady physically, socially, and spiritually. Your spiritual maturity was demonstrated to me when you began to bring Ron to the church and got him involved. That showed me that you were concerned about his spiritual condition, the man that you believed that God had given you to share your life with and be your husband. Vicki, you were faithful in the very beginning from bringing Ron to church with you. If you had lived in Bible times, I'm confident that God would have included your name in his biblical Ladies Hall of Fame. And because of your giving spirit, your loving personality, your spiritual awareness, I believe that you'll become a model wife. Ron is a very fortunate man, indeed. And one day, God, as God blesses you with a family, I believe together you'll build a strong family of love and compassion and a model, model, model Christian couple that the world might see Christ in your life. It's very obvious by the characters of Ron and Vicki that the Fernelia and Miller families have performed a magnificent job in teaching and rearing their children. I believe that Ron and Vicki will now carry on the great heritage of their families as they transmit the values of their love which they have been taught into their own family created through this union today. Who gives this woman in marriage? Thank you, sir. You may be seated as we pray. If you would bow your heads with me, we'll ask God's blessings upon this marriage. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the Word of God. It leaves us no doubt as to where man came from. And then there, God, no doubt as how man is to live. You say in your Word that it's not good that man be alone. And dear Lord, you tell us that Man is to replenish the earth. 
And you say, blessed is the man that has his quiver too full when you're speaking of children. I pray you would bless Ron and Nikki. Make me their servant. And for the next few days and weeks as they go into this new experience in their life, the greatest experience apart from salvation that man has afforded mankind, I pray that you'd cause me to pray for them often. Bless them. Bless these guests here today. For Jesus' sake. creation God made man in his own likeness. The Lord God said it's not good for man to live alone. I'll make a suitable companion to help him. So God created woman from the rib of man. She was not of his head to rule over him. Neither was she out of his feet to be trampled on by him, but out of his side to be equal with him, under his arm to be protected by him, and near his heart to be loved by him. Thus God the Holy Father himself created the institution of marriage. As the scripture says, for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they will become one flesh, so they're no longer two but one. To become one flesh means that two persons share everything that they have, not only their bodies, not only their material possessions, but also their thinking, and their feeling, their joy, and their suffering, their hopes, and their fears, their successes, and their failures. To become one flesh means that two persons become completely one with body, with soul, and spirit, and yet remain two different persons. This is the innermost mystery of marriage. It's hard to understand, and maybe we can't understand it at all. We can only experience it. It must be understood that becoming one flesh is a process. Ron, you and Vicki, at the conclusion of this ceremony today, you'll legally be husband and wife. However, you must make a new commitment each day that you want to be married. Love is not a single act, but it's a climate in which you live. 
a lifetime adventure in which you're always learning, you're always discovering, and thank God you're always growing. Love is not destroyed by one single failure, neither is it won by one single caress. Love is a climate. It's a climate of the heart. Marriage is given to husband and wife, and they comfort and help each other in need and in plenty, in sorrow and in happiness. It's given that with delight and tenderness they may know each other in love, and through the joy of their bodily union, they strengthen the unions of their heart and their lives. Ron, you and Vicki, if you both freely desire to be united in holy wedlock today, signify it by the joining together of your right hands and make preparation to exchange your vows of commitment between each other before God and these assembled witnesses. These two have come here to promise to face the future together, accepting whatever joy or sadness might lie ahead in their lives. Nothing is easier than saying words, and nothing is harder than living them day after day. Ron, you and Vicki, what you promise today must be renewed. It must be rededicated tomorrow and each day that stretches out before you. May I encourage you as you are now, continue to pray together. Read your Bible together. Trust God together. And trust each other. And God will bless your lives together. Ron, will you take Vicki to be your wife? Will you love and respect her? Will you be honest with her always and in all things? Will you make whatever sacrifices which are necessary so that you can genuinely share your life with her? I do. Then please repeat after me. I, Ron, take the Vicky to be my wife. I, Ron, take Vicky to be my wife. And in so doing, I commit my life to you. So I commit my life to you. Encompassing all sorrows and joys. Encompassing all and joys. All hardships and triumphs. And all hardships and triumphs. All experiences of life. A commitment made in love. Commitment made in love. Dipped in faith. Dipped in faith. Lived in hope. Lived in hope. And eternally made new. Vicki, will you take Ron to be your husband? Will you love and respect him? Will you be honest with him always and in all things? Will you make whatever sacrifices which are necessary so that you can genuinely share your life with him? I do. Then please repeat after me. I, Vicki, take thee, Ron, to be my husband. I, Vicki, take thee, Ron, to be my husband. And in doing so, commit my life to you. In doing so, commit my life to you. Encompassing all sorrows and joys, all hardships and triumphs, all experiences of life, a commitment made in love, dipped in faith, lived in hope, and eternally made new. The wedding ring is an outward sign of an inward and spiritual joy signifying to all the uniting of this man and this woman in holy matrimony. These rings are the symbols of the vows you've just taken, circles of holiness, perfect in form. These rings mark the beginning of a long journey together filled with wonder, surprises, laughter, tears, celebration, grief, and joy. Each bring now a symbol of your love for each other, let these rings say to all that your commitment is deep and everlasting. May I have the ring, please? Ron, take that ring and place it on the left finger, the third finger of Vicky's left hand, and please repeat after me. Vicky, I give you this sign of love. Vicky, I give you this sign of love. Knowing that love is precious and fragile. Knowing that love is precious and fragile. Yet strong. Yet strong. I give you the sign of our love. I give you the sign of our love. 
an ever-present symbol of the vows we've made together today. I give you this ring as I give you my love. Vicki, if you accept this sign of love, please repeat after me. Ron, I accept this ring as a symbol of our love. Ron, I accept this ring as a symbol of our love. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Wherever you live, I will live. Your family should be my family. Your family should be my family. Your friends should be my friends. Your friends should be my friends. Your God shall be my God. Hereafter, I will honor you with my body. Hereafter, I will honor you with my body. And I will wear this ring proudly. And I will wear this ring proudly. As your way. As your way. Vicki, take this ring and place it on the third finger of his left hand and hold it, please. Ron, this ring. Repeat after me, please. Ron, this ring, Ron, this ring without, beginning or ending, without beginning or ending, is a symbol of my undying love for you. It is made of purest metal. I give you my purest love. Please. Ron, if you accept this ring, then please repeat after me. Vicky, I accept this ring as a symbol of our love. Vicky, I accept this ring. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Yeah, I will live. Your family shall be my family. Your family shall be my family. Your friends shall be my friends. Your friends shall be my friends. And your God shall be my God. Your God shall be my God. Hereafter I will honor you with my body. And I will wear this ring proudly as your husband. I will wear this ring proudly as your husband. Join right hands and let us pray once again, please. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful, dear God, once again for the Word of God that tells us about man and then about the uniting of man and woman in holy matrimony. Dear God, you've blessed me with letting me pastor and know Ron and Vicki. And they've become a vital part of my life. They've passed through my life. And I'm thankful for that. I'll forever have a part of them. Thank you for that. I pray you'll bless them from this time forward. Have your way in their life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.
heaven or divine sanction in the presence of these assembled witnesses by the authority of the state of Texas invested in me as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I now pronounce you husband and wife. What God has joined together, let no man put asunder. You may kiss Mrs. Cornelius. May I present to you for the very, very first time, Mr. and Mrs. Ron Bernigan. <laughs>
right here. Three, two, one. Hold that position. Okay, one more. Three, two, one.
Straight on. Turn, turn this a bit. Okay. That's it. Now, can you lean forward just a bit? Okay. Just raise a little bit of the shadow. Okay. We'll get one up. Oh, I to fall through. Okay. All set. Let's get one right there. Okay. Now. This time, put your cheeks together. Okay, that doesn't look too bad there. But you had high heels on. I did have on oh. high heels.
got a light on you. Just a moment, please. Hope that you'll remember our pastor in prayer as he travels. He'll be back, I believe it's Thursday night or Friday morning, and uh, with the president in the prayer breakfast there. Let me make these announcements. If you look at your prayer and share sheet, senior and junior high are going to a Dawson McAllister Youth Conference at Prestonwood Baptist. The bus will leave at 5.30 Friday evening. There's still time to sign up if you'll see me or Teresa, and we'll get you signed up to go with us. This uh, conference is important. I hope that you'll remember in prayer. Dawson McAllister will be teaching Friday night, and then all day Saturday. He's one of the most gifted communicators to young people that I have ever heard. He'll be teaching on the subject, Who is Jesus? And uh, we'd like to see every teenager in our church go. I've got three or four that uh, would like to go but just do not have the money to go. I've got, uh, there's one girl that was saved just last week in a church service and she wants to go and uh, I'd like to have someone to pay her way and a couple of others. If you can do that, you just see me if you'd like to uh, pay a teenager's way to go to that conference. It's $23 for the whole thing. February 11th, there's a teachers and workers meeting at 7 o'clock p.m. And it's a very important meeting. We'll be launching our Acts campaign for the month of March. And we're meeting at 7 o'clock on that Wednesday night. February the 14th is our adult Valentine banquet. Uh, tickets are $17.50 each. It's going to be very elo eloquent and a fun time for adults. And the food will be great. Entertainment will be great. Everything's going to be great. <laughs> you won't want to miss this one. It will be at the Weston Hotel at the Galleria, and it's fancy. They've got it. It'll be fixed up nice. And so plan on going with us to the Valentine Banquet. If you haven't got your tickets yet, you can buy them from any staff member except me because I left mine at home. But uh, 
we've got tickets for you. The prayer requests that are known, uh, Kayla or Kim Blair gave birth to a baby, baby boy on January the 30th. And they're both at home. Wes Bunch stepped in a bucket of 380 degree grease at work. And his foot is badly burned. And uh, they're changing the bandages every day. Is he doing all right, Susan? Doing better? Okay. I remember Wes in prayer. He's 16. And it's hard for a 16-year-old boy to sit around the house. Some of you wouldn't believe that. You've got 16-year-old boys. That's all they do is sit around the house. But uh, Wes is an active young man and uh, burned his foot at work. So be sure and pray for him. Linda Fox has been sick for two weeks. Mae Duncan's not feeling well. Mamie Warren is uh, the preacher's wife's daughter, and she's still not doing very well. Maxie Maxwell. What? Preacher's wife's mother. That's what I said. <laughs> All right. Um, Maxie Maxwell, you might have seen when they did the feature in Dallas Morning News on the Dallas Life Foundation, they did a big spread on him. Just a precious, precious fella. He was mugged, and uh, they slit his throat. He's in the hospital, and he's doing all right, but he needs our prayers and really having some uh, psychiatric problems. So let's be sure to remember Maxwell in prayer tonight and then continue to pray for our staff and preacher and Winnell. Any other prayer requests tonight? Any other prayer requests? All right. Doyle Hayes is a student at Dallas Theological Seminary, teaches our fifth and sixth grade boys and girls, and does a tremendous job. Doyle, would you come and lead us in prayer? Remember these prayer requests as we go to the Lord, and we'll be dismissed. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you for the message tonight. Thank you for Tom and the work that he put into it, Lord. And we just thank you for us being able to see him, see you through him, Lord. We just thank you for our many blessings that you're going to supply throughout the week. We pray that you be go with us as we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you go, I'd like for everyone to meet uh, Mr. and Ms. Gibson. And then, uh, I've forgotten your name. Carlos. Fine, fine family. Y'all be sure to meet them as you leave.
are not found where people are constantly uh, together, either physically or emotionally. The healthiest relationships are those that move. They move out and they move back together. They move out and back together. Uh, as we first started talking today, I, I told you Sharon and I have been skiing together. We've been together night and day. It was time to move out a little bit. And then, then you come back together. That uh, avoids burnout in the relationship. If you remember uh, Liz Taylor and Richard Burton, when they had their plane, they were together every moment. They were in the newspaper every day. One would not go to the Academy Awards unless the other one was at the Academy Awards. They were together always and burned the relationship out. The healthiest relationship is one of three. And when you work together, you have to find a way to let it breathe and give each other space. Those marriages where one partner will not allow the other one to move out create some great problems. Uh, my book, Love Must Be Tough, really deals with the balance of power. And where you get into great difficulties is where, as with siblings, you have an imbalance of power. Where you have a husband who holds absolutely all the power and disrespects his wife. And she is power. I'm not talking about who makes major decisions in the past. I'm not talking about leadership. I think the Bible teaches masculine leadership in an atmosphere of servanthood to his wife. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the real power that comes from respect for one another. And when one holds all of that power and the other holds none, you got a major problem. And what is needed is a balance of the power that comes from mutual respect. Yes. I always had the fear of my children were growing up. My father was very young. I could always see her sitting in the middle of the street uh, with a car coming down the road and me having to take time to explain to her why I wanted her to move. You know, I, I demanded instant obedience. You know, we talked about it later. We discussed it later. But, but I felt so threatened that I might not be able to do what I needed to do to save her life or his life. And, uh, the authority and the power is absolutely necessary sometimes, I believe. But there's also that willingness to give and win. You've got to choose the battles that you want to win. Okay, now you've raised a very important point. This is the other half of the coin. Power, extreme power, is dangerous and temporal means, too. And there's a difference between loving authority that's in the best interest of the child because you care for him and doing what's best for him and in dominating him because you're bigger and stronger and tougher and larger than he is and if he doesn't do what you tell him to do you give him the back of the hand and he dare not move you know he lives in a fear relationship that's power that's power in parenting a mother can hold so much power that she won't allow a child to grow and develop and be independent and live his own life that's power so authority is god ordained and power in almost all of its forms is dangerous. I have the right to say to my son when he's three years of age, Ryan, you have red eyes. I let you stay up too late last night, and you're tired, and you know what happens when you lose sleep, you get sick. Look at me. Look at me, Ryan. Go brush your teeth and put on your pajamas. Brush your phone to bed. I don't negotiate. I don't drive. I don't say, I don't plead, I don't offer a new tricycle. I say, Ryan, do it. I have the authority. But that's not power. That's authority. That's loving leadership. It is different from power. Yes? I'm about dealing with a two-year-old extremely verbal daughter that um, she's learning so quickly verbally because she repeats everything anyone says. And I'm, I'm trying to decipher between if she's just being bossy, or if she's just re, you know, rewinding the tape that she hears me, Lindsay will go to bed right now, mommy, you know, <laughs> do this and do that. And I want to be so careful not to just tell uh, them that not say that. And what we're trying to do is say, mom and daddy are boss, and Lindsay's not. Well, if you're not sure what a child means by behavior, Use that occasion to set up the next one. In other words, if the child is a little sassy to you, then you don't punish him or threaten him. You just say, uh, Johnny, I'm not sure how you meant that, but that didn't sound very good. 
so we understand each other. Don't say that like that next time. Then next time it's deliberate because you draw the line. Now you know he knows because you just told him. I tell you, I got a letter from a woman uh, who had a nine-year-old who was calling her hot dog and moose and uh, <laughs> As he moved through the alphabet in school, he picked up new words to call her, and M was the moose that was going on at the time. And, uh, and this was the situation. He was using that in a power play, and she didn't realize it. She, she thought it was a game. But it really was his way of saying, I can bust you. Here's my point. I've spent the past 20 years saying, you dare not transfer power to a child too quickly because it's dangerous in any human hand, especially to a child. Uh, mother came to me with a 13-year-old uh, boy who was totally out of control. He was coming in at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. She could do absolutely nothing with him. And he just tearing the whole family up. And I sat and chatted with her, and I said, do you remember where you lost control of this child? And she said, strangely enough, I remember exactly where it happened. She said, the day things really fell apart has never been the same since. But when he was three years of age, I took him in and put him in, my, in his crib to take a nap. And this kid spit in her face to demonstrate his attitude toward nap time. She wiped it off. She had been told that she could negotiate her way out of all conflict. And she did, began explaining to him why you don't do that, mommy? And he did it again. And she became more irritated, wiped it off, and began explaining again, and he did it again. She didn't remember everything that happened, but it must have been a wild scene. In fact, folks, I think child abuse often grows out of that precise situation. We handcuff parents, we strip them of the ability to handle these frustrations. They get more tense, more angry, don't know what to do, and then explode and do too much and sometimes kill a child. I don't know what happened, but she shook him and she screamed at him all the time he was sitting in her face. She ran out of the door, she slammed the door, and he spit on the back of the door as she left. She said, I never had control of that child from that moment to this. Now that was a powerful one. And that's pretty heavy stuff for a three-year-old child. You must not transfer authority and power too quickly. But you must not do it too late, and therein lies the problem. Because what makes a great parent of a three-year-old child makes a bad parent of a 19-year-old. You've got to learn to let go. We're going to talk about that after the break, and uh, enjoy the next 15, 20 minutes. and minds in Christ Jesus. I will. 